overs now, facing Snow as he comes up. The last ball is over. It's a short one. He hits it hard and high to mid-wicket boundary. It's to six. No, no, it just drops inside the boundary rope, so it's only four. And that makes the score now 274 for three and the end of the over. I see the drinks are coming out. Well, I expect the players could do with them. It's a beautiful day here. The temperature's in the 80s. There's not a cloud in the sky. And a huge crowd are in their shirt sleeves and without shirts. I bet they'll be pretty sore tomorrow. Things aren't looking too good for England. Uh, I wonder what Colin Cowdery's going to do next. I think I'd give Boycott a try from the nursery end. It might tempt the batsman to do something rash, but anyhow, we'll soon see, because the 12th man's going off for the drinks now. No, David Brown's coming on for another over. Yes. It's a ritual which concentrates the English summer as nothing else can gives it a local habitation and a name. And as the patterns on the pitch dissolve, as the players change places over by over, on some sun drowsy afternoon, time and place can dissolve too into a vision of all the matches throughout the land which are being or ever have been played. Hobbs on his unhurried way to another hundred beneath the gasometer at the oval the ground trembling under the impact of W.G. going out to bat. A beautiful sweep from Compton, an oath from Truman, and Bradman batting, of course, like a demonstration of the laws of nature, like the breeze blowing or the sun shining. Bradman batting. Men in the slips stoop down together like puppets on a string. Bowlers, the applied psychologists, deploy their arts of siege. Batsmen drive and cut through every loophole. And in the evening, they walk back to the pavilion, suntan sore on the backs of their necks, relaxed after toil. The strenuous alliance between devious mind and skilled muscle, which is the art of cricket. It's an art which has been subtly refined over the centuries, like the development of the streamlined bat we use today from the rough club of George III's time. Oliver Cromwell, of all unlikely people, did more than anybody to help the game along. During his repressive Commonwealth, the nobility sulked on their country estates long enough to become fascinated by the farm boys' long games on the village green. Glance from your post in the long field, young cricketer, away to those woods and farms, spars and hills about you. One day you will seek in your mind for the scores of the match which are now so important, and they will not be there. Only in place of them, the assurance of an eternal summer. Noblemen who wanted to play cricket had to play with their villagers. And when the restoration brought them all back to the merry monarch's swinging London, they took their cricket with them, a marvellous vehicle for betting. By 1730, they were playing for a thousand guineas a match, a fortune in those days. And this meant the drawing up of a code of rules to decide the bets. By then, these noble connoisseurs of the arts had made of cricket a thing so refined and subtle that it could rank as one of them. But a village was still the nerve centre of cricket. Hambledon, on Broad Hapney Down in Hampshire, in the second half of the 18th century, fielded a cricket team strong enough to meet and beat the rest of England. John Myron was the great man of Hambledon, almost a national dictator. He laid down the law on all questions of procedure and precedent. As landlord of the bat and ball, he was somehow licensed to differ from a superior without offending him or compromising his own independence. Hambledon decided everything, from the width of bats to the law about underarm bowling. It's a long haul from the tallyman notching his stick to the elaborate tic-tac and electronic scoreboards of today. But with so much money at stake, instant authority had to rule on the pitch. And in this conflict of giant characters, the man in the white coat must have it in him to outface them all. Hold 
Unpartiality is the badge of his calling. And with 47 laws of cricket and hundreds of qualifying rules to keep in his head for instant application, the umpire has to be a sort of cross between a faultless computer and a great headmaster. These tensions tend to develop an outsized in personalities. What great umpires exhibit is style. It was the bowling of a cricketer called Lumpy Stevens which decreed the third stump. Lumpy was so accurate, the ball was always going through the gap. So they put a middle one in. That was in 1790, and by the end of the century, after other small changes had been made, cricket became very much the game we know now. At that point, control over cricket left the village forever. Hambledon declined, the Marylebone Cricket Club took over. Thomas Lord arrived. A successful wine merchant, he was coached to the White Cundit Cricket Club. He was mad about cricket and had a good business head. The combination appealed to the leading patrons who asked him to establish and manage a new cricket ground. They guaranteed him against financial loss. That's how the MCC was born and permanently set up by the turn of the century in St John's Wood. Not at all the place we know today. It was the sort of field you'd graze your sheep on, on the way to Smithfield Market. They said the playing surface resembled a billiard table only because of the pockets. By the middle of the century, they'd found the answer. And this was where the great game and its headquarters were to grow into a vast national monument. Thomas wouldn't recognize his patch of St John's Wood nowadays. Lords, where even the tulips are brought up to wear the colours of the MCC. The heart of Englishness in the 19th century was village cricket. The onlookers and the players various in age, in ability and calling, but with a common courtesy uniting them, their understanding of cricket on the sidelines and on the field, fighting out its battles, not for lust of conquest nor pride of place, but for the light of an idea. Among the devices of man for being a social animal, a cricket tour was the Victorian triumph, taking to the road in a jovial crew, like a well-fed pilgrimage of Chaucer's friends. To be one of a numerous body, to be authorized to say we, to have a rightful interest in victory or defeat, is gratifying at once to social feeling and to personal pride. Cricket, the ever changeful, changeless game. An eccentricity which for a thorough appreciation a man must be bred from the cradle. There are so many things in playing or watching cricket, apart from the skill and the score. This is a very humanizing game, a cure for intellectuals and snobs, a game that appeals to the emotions of patriotism and pride, but which is, at the same time, eminently unselfish. I'll bowl from this end, and you can have which end you like. What do batsmen have in their minds as they go out? Good resolutions based on past mistakes? Advice from the pavilion, don't leave the ball alone, it never wins matches. Play straight, play straight. There never was such a game for advice. It comes from every quarter. Be sure not to forget the umpire. Inquire after his health, say what a good bowler his father was. To go to a cricket match for nothing but the cricket is like going to a pub for nothing but the drink. In the 1850s, 
the landlady of the Trent Bridge Inn married the captain of the All England Eleven, and the offspring of that union was the Trent Bridge Ground. By now, most of the country had organised county cricket, which became the basic framework of the national game. The great matches were played on the county grounds, which the cities found themselves making room for. At the Oval, long before the gasometers arrived, it was Albert the Prince Consort who rightly and properly prevented that ground from being leased as a building site, if for no other reason, to earn himself the title of Albert the Good. The professionals were making headway too. Already, players like Fuller Pilch and 20 Stone Alfred Min, the Lion of Kent, were earning 10 times the average wage, with gigantic bonuses in the big matches, simply for trundling up and down the pitches of the Empire's summer. There was no priority about county matches. Often their teams were made up from whatever players were not committed elsewhere. This scratch collection is Yorkshire at Bramall Lane. But spruceness and uniformity prevailed in the end. Professionals opted for pink polka dot shirts. And the gentlemen amateurs, a casual style of throwaway elegance. Some of the best paid amateurs found themselves caught between two stools. The famous cricketer, apart from a very few like WG who shamelessly played to the gallery, takes some trouble to seem unconscious of his star quality as a personality, but rarely with complete success. Can such a man's value be assessed purely in terms of runs and wickets? How much do you pay a good bowler, for instance? Not much. No industry would have the nerve to work a man as hard as a bowler works, and no bowler nowadays comes anywhere near Alfred Min's equivalent of 80 or 100 pounds a week. Whatever they get out of it, it isn't money but some great incentive there must be to keep them flogging themselves to death on heartless pitches up and down the country all through the summer. George Parr's tree still stands at Nottingham, and George Parr, who hit sixes over it with monotonous regularity, captained the first cricket expedition to the United States. A lion when facing bumpers at the crease. From the first moment on board ship, he gave himself up for lost. And it was indeed a dreadful voyage. Wisdom, one of the players, looked down on the raging seas and said, what this pitch needs is ten minutes of the heavy roller. The first foreign nation to tour England at cricket no longer plays the game because it is extinct. It was the Australian Wernbrook tribe with its team of Aborigines. One happy sundown played in only two matches. One run in the first, a duck in the second. Happy, happy sundown to travel all round the world for one run. But was it cricket that finished off the Wareham Brooks? No one knows. Australian cricket of 1882, at any rate, was no laughing matter, for it brought Spofforth with it. In the desperate intensity of the Oval Test, one spectator dropped down dead, another gnawed pieces from his umbrella handle, and Spofforth, the demon bowler, made cricket history. 14 wickets for 90 runs. During the following winter's tour, when the English had won the rubber, some Australian ladies burned a bale, which they sealed in an urn, and that was the beginning of how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes. Spofforth was the one person unafraid of Dr. W.G., that grand old gentleman who kept his patients waiting while he filled up wisdom with his records and earned the odd £8,000 a year. He was an amateur, of course. In the Empire's late afternoon, the sun shone on Edwardian England and on cricket, now an accepted background to the aristocratic social game. It was the golden age, when great names and their deeds were not only the constant summer concern of the English people, but high social fashion as well. It was absolutely right that an Indian prince should have adorned this era. Ranjit Singhji seemed to justify all the Empire building, made it almost cosy. Cricket had reached ripeness. Empire touring teams invaded every year. 
people had time to watch and players to perfect their genius, their brilliance matched by the warm appreciation of the crowd. Greatness tells, as in the touch of a painter on a detail, taking just one from among those great names, Trumper, the most gallant and chivalrous batsman of them all. A name that still carries the glow of that great harvest time of the talents, which seemed destined to last forever. Cricket cannot escape the fate of all pleasant things. I see them in foul dugouts, gnawed by rats, and in the ruined trenches, lashed with rain, dreaming of things they did with balls and bats. In the trenches in May 1916, I remembered that the cricket season should have just about begun, but the thought died in me almost as soon as it was born. The essence of cricket is subtle, and I didn't feel under the burden of destruction that its complex sources would ever be well recreated. When the guns ceased fire, and Lords was auctioning cricket treasures for the Wounded Soldiers Fund, the game had changed. A whole way of life was in doubt. The national game is sensitive to the spirit and atmosphere of the period, and as the nation's life contracted after the war, the expansive image of the golden amateur gave way to a more technical approach. But there are some splendid memories from the 20s and 30s, spiced with the deeds of Gilligan and Tate and Hammond, and Sutcliffe and Hobbs, known to the cartoonists as the old firm. Hobbs and Sutcliffe, the old firm, were still walking out of the crease together when boys who'd collected their pictures on cigarette cards handed them on to their sons. Jardine said, Hobbs is number one batsman all the time. He's so good on bad pitches. He was much more than that. Hobbs was magic. As the words spread along the sunny pavements of lunchtime London, Hobbs is in. Telephones rang, taxis were hailed and crammed to bursting. Pubs emptied. What they went to see was sheer mastery. Not of any particular stroke, he had them all nor for any piece of characteristic brilliance, but for the whole art of cricket. More often than not, a Hobbs innings was a masterpiece, and no more unassuming master ever trod the pitch. To crown all his other records, he made more centuries after he was 40 than he did before. A day's leisure watching the great can be more exhausting than playing, for your time is spent in every department with anxious imagination and unrelieved sense of the difficulties. One beauty of cricket is that if you can't play at it, you can at least look on and talk very learnedly and find fault with the captain, showing how you would have ordered matters had you been consulted. Between the wars, it was Don Bradman who most truly demonstrated computer cricket. Safe, sure, run-getting, streamlined, without any naughty impulses from the soul. At least he must have seemed all of that to the bowling. There was only one crack in his armour, Larwood's leg bowling under the captaincy of Jardine. The idea was to set a tight ring of fielders on the leg side and then pitch the ball on the leg stump. The batsman was forced to play every ball. If he didn't play it into the ground, he was caught. If he missed it, it hit him. Ooh. Add to this theory the cannonball speed of Larwood and his extreme accuracy, and you had the bodyline bowling rumpus. During the Adelaide test, they nearly had to cancel the tour, and England won the Ashes for the only time during Bradman's career. There seems no doubt that bodyline bowling was legal. That it wasn't lethal as well seems to have been just the luck of the game. Death by cricket ball is not unknown. Not cricket was the general verdict on bodyline, and so it died. Punch and Patsy Hendron put it in its proper perspective. Hendron helped to melt away whatever animosity had built up. He was a man of great character and charm. Not only was he a tremendous hitter of sixes, but with his sad face he could wring a laugh from even a Sydney crowd in an ugly mood. They vanish, these immortal players. And we suddenly realize with astonishment that years have gone by 
without even a passing mention of them. At one point, they seem as much a part of the permanent scheme of things as the sun which glows upon their familiar faces and the grass which makes a background for their portraits. And then, it's time for them to go. Great cricket has its merciless side. Another set of great names was to fade from the talk in the long room at Lord's. September the 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. Neville Cardus was in the long room with a distinguished looking member he didn't know. Suddenly two workmen came in and removed the bust of W.G. Grace and the member said, Did you see that, sir? That means war. Cricket has been held up often enough in the past for all kinds of reasons. But it never takes more than one sunny summer to pull the game together again. 1947 was just such a tonic summer. And about time too, after a frightful winter of floods on top of rationing and power cuts. That summer was a relief for everybody. Crowds crammed the grounds, county membership boomed, takings at the gate broke all records. It seemed as if the golden days were back again. You could be persuaded that golden cricket would go sweeping on with Compton into the second half of the century. Compton's was an all-time record for runs in a season that year, and nothing of the computer about any of them. The splendor of his batting was only equaled by the atrociousness of his running. He gave day-long displays of natural strokes that summer, which galvanized the veterans. Lovely, sir, lovely. And Hutton. There was somebody to turn over in your mind. Those who say there's an out romantic about Yorkshire cricket are self-deceivers. Back in 1938, Hutton had made 364 against the Aussies, beating Bradman's record. And here he was, still carrying us along after the war. You could deduce the whole grammar and alphabet of cricket from Hutton's classic game. Just to spoil it all, Bradman brought over a chilling team who played like humanoids from outer space. They went home after 31 matches, undefeated. There was a time when Australia produced poets like English poets, but a little out of touch. Now she had her own, quite distinct in rhythm and passion, and Lindwall was their crown bard. The centre has shifted. Now it's England that's out of touch, retreating daunted from the field. A batsman is like a castle under siege. The direct cannonball can breach his defences, but his ruin is more likely from subtle outflanking movements designed to enlist his own skilled rhythm against him. You have to play some sort of stroke to get out. You're more likely to attempt one if you're a good cricketer. Rain. Not only a miserable morale breaker in its own right, but to a batsman a process of robbery. His eyesight, his sure-footedness, his grip, all suffer a swift decline. It's all very English, and I remember them trying to build my character on cricket in the rain at school. A failure, as it turned out. And, of course, rheumatism is called the English disease. And how determined we are to keep these highly tuned muscles out to soak, if it's humanly possible to keep the game going. They say that Fitzgerald translated Omar Khayyam during a rain-stop play. In the second long post-war convalescence, the pace and quality of the cricket was, once again, in step with the national mood. Bowlers took a long time to get through their overs. Batsmen were not making as many runs. There was a general lack of urgency about the game. It developed all the symptoms of a war of attrition. Stop the other side scoring, even if you don't score. No wonder the Chancellor of the Exchequer took the entertainment tax off cricket. It wasn't entertaining anymore. 
An injection of West Indian high spirits is just what the game needs and fortunately what it gets as tourist time comes round again. Cricket frenzy invades the stands and on the pitch that exuberance which Leary Constantine had proved back in the 20s could go hand in hand with world class performance. In the 50s, the three W's, Weeks, Worrell and Walcott, proved it again. There are things indeed that make more noise and do as little good, such as making war and then peace, singing more songs and forgetting them, making money and throwing it away. But the game of cricket is what no one despises who has ever played it, or who has watched a star at the height of his confidence. Gary Sobers, for instance, the genius of the game made flesh. A man with all the gifts, including that indefinable one of charm, which seems to cling around left-handers. Besides being, arguably, the most brilliant batsman of the century, and he once hit six sixes in an over, he can also, apparently, be any kind of bowler he wants to be. And an ace fielder is into the bargain. That long, loose loop proclaims the tiger. And cricket, so merciless to the second rate, has also the capacity to underwrite the near divinity of these great natural phenomena on their rare appearances among us. As we close in on today, it gets more difficult to choose the great moments of the record. But one of them in the 50s was certainly Lakers bowling against the Aussies at Manchester, when Bradman's empire crumbled at last. Ten wickets in the first innings, and then on to a total of 19. And Graveney, the graceful, who never had to belt the ball. It just slid off his bat and smacked the boundary before you could see it. No histrionics, a great stylist who gently and firmly held us together over two decades though he was left out in the wilderness for years while all the cricketers were saying, you must play Graveney, he's got class. And the last, perhaps, of the great personalities? Truman? Fiery Fred, whose bowling begins so long before the ball leaves his hands. Truman himself reckons he's in business as an entertainer, and certainly this is what the crowds like to see. But far too many English cricketers have, for a time, become far too diffident too tentative to give it to them. Just one or two players, one or two spirited matches lighten the general gloom. Games, in the end, must die or be modified. And now a new structure was in process of formation. The wisdom which informed it had been gelling within the Northern League for years. It was bred of a keen spirit of competition and the desire to make commercial sense of cricket. The obvious way was to cut down the length of a match to one day, to provide the sort of players the public would pay to see, and to pay them well. That's how it looked to some hard-headed northern industrialists. Teams like the Cavaliers found it made good sense. You go to these matches to see the faces which fit the great names in the sports pages. quite rightly go where the game is bright and doesn't die on you. Most sport-watching people want to see a man doing something exciting very well. And cricket has reached such a stage of refinement that much of it is exciting only to the expert. The farm boy's old knock-up game has lost a vital fibre. But competitions, sponsored by industry, can compete as entertainment with any other beckoning hand. This is our native gift that haunts us like the air we breathe in the morning and the evening and lures us to it without question or anything but willing hearts. Where else, you ask, can England's game be seen rooted so deep as on the village green?
here in the slum where doubtful sunlight falls to gild three stumps chalked on decaying walls. Soft the sunset falls upon the pitch. The game is over and the stumps are drawn. The willow sleeps in its appointed niche. The heavy roller waits another dawn. 